my name is Dana Kaplan. I've been working on the issue of transforming the juvenile and criminal justice system for about a decade now. So there's not a lot of things that surprise me after having doing this work. I've, I've seen a lot. But there are some stories that on some days stand out to me so strongly that I can't shake them and that night remember why it is that I got involved in this issue in the first place. A couple years ago, I was in a prison right outside Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I was meeting with a group of men who have been sentenced to life without parole sentences for offenses that they committed when they were juveniles. And I was talking to one of these men, we'll call him Matt, and he was telling me about what his employment was outside of the prison system. He said, you know, when I'm not here, I'm working at the governor's mansion. I said, what do you do at the governor's mansion? And he said, well, I'm a butler for the governor, which means that I cut sandwiches for his kids, I've served food and lunch and dinner to the dignitaries, and I help take care of his kids sometimes. They often misbehave. And I sat there and I looked at this man and I thought, he can be trusted to serve food to the governor's children, but he will never, ever have the opportunity to even be considered for his freedom. And this is one of those things to me that is one of the fallacies and the hypocrisies of the United States criminal justice system. It far too often doesn't have enough to do with real public safety, but is about all sorts of other factors instead. And I looked at this man who was around my age in, the, or in his early 30s, and I thought about how different my future looks and how different his future looks and how much it was both respectively shaped by incidents that happened when he was 15 years old and when I was 15 years old, sitting on the steps of Hunter College High School. And I think often about how those different paths and opportunities that led us to such different directions is just permeates the entire United States criminal justice system. It's one of the reasons I got involved for change. Now, a lot of you might already know some of the facts of the system, so if so, I apologize if it's repetitive, but I think that they're important enough to bring out. So, the United States incarcerates more people than any other country in the world at a rate. Although we are only 5% of the world's population, we are 25% of the prison population. There are currently more than 2 million people in prison, which is a 500% increase over the last 30 years. The funding implications are significant. This is a chart from when I was in high school in New York uh, in the 90s that shows the dollar for dollar trade-off between spending on higher education and spending on corrections. More than 50% of people in prison are in there for nonviolent offenses, drug or property offenses. And the racial implications are stark. As you can see, the number of blacks and Latinos who are incarcerated is a rate that is significantly higher than the white community. Even though research has demonstrated that when black youth, white youth, and Latino youth are arrested for the same offenses, it is blacks and Latinos that are gonna face higher rates of conviction and receive larger sentences. What does that mean? It means that currently in the United States, one in three young black men is under some form of criminal justice supervision. We are the only country in the world that will sentence a child to life without parole sentences. These are the faces of some of the people in Louisiana who are currently serving life without parole for offenses committed when they were children, many of whom I work with and their families. And all of this is despite the fact that, again, research demonstrates that high rates of incarceration do not necessarily correlate to public safety. And many of the jurisdictions that, in fact, have the least number of people incarcerated are the ones that have made the biggest strides in reducing violent crime. I got interested in this issue actually when I was leaving uh, Hunter College High School and became an undergraduate at the University of California at Berkeley, an institution that I went to because I wanted to continue my education at one of the premier public institutions like my experience at Hunter had been so positively for. Unfortunately, when I got to Berkeley, I also got there in the wake of the outlawing of affirmative action. And so the demographics on my campus changed significantly in the four years that I was there. Black and brown faces were decreasingly present in classes, on campus, in the dorms. But I took an internship at the San Francisco County Jail. And every Friday, I would take the BART across the bay and spend my afternoons running programming, GED classes, 
movie nights, whatever it was. And I saw that those black and brown faces that were decreasingly present in my classroom were filling up the San Francisco County Jail. And I began to understand that criminal justice reform is one of the key civil rights issues of our time. When 70% of the people in prison are black and Latino, but only 15% of the people who are admitted to UC Berkeley this year have that same background, then we have a problem. When 50% of New York City is black and Latino, but less than 10% of students in amazing and elite public uh, institutions like Hunter, like Stuyvesant, like Bronx Science, where my siblings went, are black and Latino, then we have a problem. And when spending in higher education has gone up by only 21% in the last uh, few years, but spending on corrections has increased by 127%, there's some days where it feels like it's a problem by design. It's not just cuts to education that have been of impact. It's all of our social services. All of the programs that we know actually improve public safety are threatened by the massive increase in spending on corrections that has decimated some communities of color. So it's a racial justice agenda. It needs to be part of any progressive agenda for change. When we talk about where are we gonna get the money to fund government programs that are so direly needed, we have a solution. So it's a progressive agenda, a racial justice agenda, and it's common sense. We have a number of allies in this, in this work. So for one, the overwhelming cost of corrections has brought a number of people into the fold. We spent $68 billion on corrections in 2010. As I said earlier, over the past 20 years, nationwide spending on higher education has increased by 21%. Corrections, 127. And some of the people that are sounding the call for reform are not the ones that you would think. A quote from Newt Gingrich. There is an urgent need to address the astronomical growth in the prison population. We spend 300% more than 25 years ago. These facts should trouble every American. We can no longer afford business as usual. The criminal justice system is broken and conservatives must lead in fixing it. Conservatives, progressives, Democrats, Republicans, Green Party, Independent, all of us must work together to change this broken system. And I'll end with a story that is a little bit more hopeful of where I see real change taking root. For one, in New York State, for the first time, we certainly have seen political leadership in closing seven prisons. As someone who used to work in upstate New York on criminal justice reform, I can tell you that's a surprise and great to see. But I'll talk about my current city and hometown of New Orleans, Louisiana. Before the hurricane devastated the city and the levees failed, we had the dubious distinction of having the highest rate of incarceration in the world <laughs> because we're in the home state with the highest rate of incarceration in the city that incarcerated the most. We had a jail of 7,500 beds pre-Katrina. And in the last couple years, as we slog through the slow pace of recovery, we finally begun to get to the point of saying, well, what should this new jail look like? And the sheriff had initially proposed it be re rebuilt back up to almost the same size. Now, there was a lot of things that the floodwaters brought to the city that were devastating, but one of the things that it produced was an opportunity to take a look at our public policies and say, where are we failing and where can we perhaps do something different? And criminal justice reform was one of those areas. From uptown to downtown, New Orleans East, the French Quarter, the Garden District, St. Charles Avenue, people actually began to come together and say, we don't need to incarcerate an overwhelming percentage of our citizens, and particularly for low-income African Americans, this is not the future we want. We took out a full-page ad in the Times-Picayune, and we asked people to pledge $22.39, the cost of one day in jail, and say what they would like to see that $22.39 be spent on instead of rebuilding our jail. You can't necessarily see it from where you're sitting, but I'll say that the answers came pouring in. We heard from the cast and the crew of HBO's Treme. We heard from jazz musicians in New Orleans, artists, a former judge, a former city council member, activists, uptown ladies. We got the whole range who sent in $22.39 times four, whatever they could, and said, we would like to see you do things like create jobs so that crime will be reduced, revive the New Orleans Recreational Development Program, mental health supports, 
uh, clean up the lead that is poisoning our kids. Schools, parks, recreation, fix the chop, the potholes. Some of them got really specific what corner the pothole needed to be fixed on. <laughs> Reopen Charity Hospital, rebuild the Ninth Ward. The answers came flooding in. And we brought all of those answers to a city council meeting and we talked about how we wanted to see our taxpayer dollars get spent. And the answer and response from the city council was a unanimous vote to cap our jail at less than 1,500 beds, a quarter of its pre-Katrina size, and to talk about how we could reinvest those dollars into something that is going to be meaningful and build real public safety for all residents of the city. I urge everyone in this room who's interested in social, social justice, racial justice, equality, to put criminal justice reform on your agenda for what a real future looks like, both for the cost of human lives, but also the cost savings that it can generate and what we can do with that money in a time of fiscal crisis instead. And hopefully, with that type of public policy agenda, we'll have a future where all of these kids no longer have their lives shaped by prison bars in the future, but have the opportunities that so many of us were blessed to receive at schools such as Hunter. Thank you. Stay for one second, I'll ask you a I'm, I'm just curious, we need to keep this moving for time, but just in a few seconds. Do you think that the recession, the ongoing economic slump, is actually creating a lot of opportunity because people are looking differently at the amount that we're spending on prisons? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think that you see when, you know, you see conservatives like uh, Pat Nolan and Newt Gingrich come out with the Right on Crime initiative, there's been a real alliance between a lot of fiscal conservatives um, and conservative organizations with groups like the NAACP, and you've seen some real outcomes in criminal justice reform. One of the things that we'll take, though, is a political will. So last year in the Louisiana legislature, there was a number of bills proposed that would have reduced the number of people in prison, and the Sheriff's Association came in and basically killed those bills because they knew that they would lose the revenue of having all of those state prisoners housed in their local jails. So there is an opportunity, but we have to seize it. Thank you very much.